Ambassador Wisner, we are very happy to, uh, and very honored to be with you uh, today. And uh, we thank you for your precious time. Uh, uh, knowing, we, know, we know you are, you are busy on several missions across the world. And we are in particular happy to speak to you uh, just very close to your uh, birthday as you, uh, as you <laughs> disclose to us. And it's very good to, to meet again uh, with, with, a, with an old friend. So uh, the topic of today is, is a brief conversation on AUKUS. Uh, AUKUS got launched some uh, quarters ago uh, with bit of turmoil as it succeeded the previous contract between Australia and France. But we believe, even though we speak from France, that this turmoil, that this rumor and turmoil has kind of overshadowed the, the important issues, which is that uh, AUKUS got framed in the context of a very impressive rise indeed of the Chinese Navy and its associated armaments uh, in, a concept, in, a, in a context, sorry, as well of multiple Sino-Australian tensions. And this all very understandably lead, uh, led the United, United States and Australia to uh, review their, their arrangements. Uh, now the matter, initial matter has been settled and the AUKUS uh, seems to be uh, uh, sailing, uh, sailing on its way. So my, my first question would be uh, for you to uh, kind of give us a, a, a first assessment of the AUKUS results, knowing that it's not just a geostrategical, geostrategic alliance, sorry. It's more uh, like a technology-based technology alliance uh, to equip a nation, to equip a nation for the uh, underwater uh, 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 activities. So, uh, what is your assessment so far on this technological al alliance at the light of the geopolitical shifts that happened since the launch of AUKUS, which I need not to uh, uh, re restate here. Joel and Arna, first of all, let me tell you how pleased, how delighted I am to be with you. Um, the subject is of vital importance. I'm going to give you my answer in a slightly different context, and that is to take a step back and situate AUKUS and what is occurring on a technological and military basis inside a broader political context. If we don't do that, I think we miss the point and we undershoot the target that we're trying to reach. Um, in essence, all of us, uh, particularly the United States, finally came out of a period of hibernation and woke up to the fact that the competition with China is very real, very severe, and will last for very many years. With that in mind, the way to respond to the competition is to respond at a variety of levels. And that has been the purpose of American policy, to attempt to signal to China that yes, it's possible to live in peace, but with respect for the boundaries of permissible behavior. And China has exceeded those in its economic competition, now in its gradual expansion of its military presence, its global footprint. Uh, it is all taken together, posed a very real uh, matter of concern to the United States and indeed to Europe. The response, as I say, is multiple, many fold. First, uh, there is a political response. It takes several forms. Most recently at the <clears throat> uh, G7, uh, there was a signal of concern from a variety of Western nations with backed up with the Koreans and the Japanese. It takes the form furthermore of uh, direct signals to China from NATO uh, indicating that China is a matter of security concern. Um, third, it has taken a tangible form, first under the Trump administration and now more recently under Biden's presidency in the enhancement, formation and enhancement of the Quad of <clears throat> the United States, India, um, Japan, um, and Australia. 
um, all, if you look at all of these together, every step that is being taken is sending a signal to China that we are going to equip ourselves politically, militarily, technologically, commercially to compete with China and see if we can find a modus vivendi somewhere out there. I don't see it yet. So that's where I start with AUKUS. AUKUS is, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm rusty on the details, but I actually think it started with the Australians being disobliged by the Chinese, reaching out. The British played a role in bringing us and the Australians together. As you know, <clears throat> that ended up with a nuclear arrangement for submarine uh, submarines that will be able to indicate directly to China that Australia has the ability to defend herself and will be fully backed in this regard by the United States and indeed Britain. It came unfortunately with a very disruptive effect on France and the relationships between France, Australia, and sotto voce France and the rest of us. I am very pleased that that's been overcome. Why am I pleased? France is an important Asia actor. France is a key player in the China equation. France is an Asian power. So it's vitally important to signal to China that we're all aligned. So I look at AUKUS as a military dimension among other military dimensions, strengthening of American forces in the Pacific, shifting base presences, um, standing up to China politically, the recent demonstration of concern over the Solomon Islands, all of these are part of a package of indications to China that the West is increasingly unified, concerned by Chinese overreach and prepared to stand up to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Frank. I, I, I have to share something with you. I, I, I'm an optimist. I don't know if it's good in geopolitics, but uh, uh, first of all, thank you for your kind words on, on different powers uh, on this planet. Uh, the situation having changed so much, uh, the concerns for uh, and even though you, you, the message that is displaced, as you rightly mentioned, is very clear, the uncertainties have grown considerably and uh, many observers, many analysts are worried that the uh, Pacific, that South China Sea, that Strait of Taiwan might follow suit with or might inspire uh, the situation there might be inspired by, by the situation in Russia. So th there's a considerable amount of uh, worry uh, uh, on this planet. I don't necessarily belong to those who are worried, but I rather belong to those who believe that there's maybe an opportunity and AUKUS being again a technological alliance. And as you aptly mentioned, uh, the initial uh, tension uh, between Australia and France got solved. My, my optimism puts me to envisage scenarios uh, on which on uh, precisely the nuclear dimension of, of the technology, technological agreement, possibly France or uh, beyond the nuclear on, on some other armaments, uh, as you know that Europe is gaining on some strategic autonomy and that France and Germany are getting closer, where, where one could possibly see a, a you know, uh, kind of an extension or agreements between the AUKUS and some of the European powers to actually establish the link and, and, and translate what you said about different countries from Europe being actual players uh, in, in, in the region. So uh, in, in plain words, do you think that the current evolution of global geopolitics could lead to a, a, an option to kind of renew the conversation or the technological cooperation between AUKUS uh, and France, for instance. 
And maybe the subsequent question with India, as uh, we're having today, uh, Arnav Das uh, from India uh, with us. India is a specific nuclear power. Of course, it hasn't signed the non-proliferation treaty that makes it specific, but uh, shares equal concern with the, with the rise of, of China in those seas. These are important points. I'm afraid that you and I are of common view that the global situation is extremely troubled. We're at a period of uh, literally of transformation. And we don't know where the overall story is going to end up. Uh, Ukraine is only the most recent uh, terrible out <clears throat> uh, demonstration of the breakdown of a rough sense of balance in the global order. So I think we're facing a long haul and that key to it will be trying to find an equilibrium with China. Uh, key to it will be finding ways to signal to China that we could live in peace, but if China wishes to compete without regard to limits, then increasingly China is going to face a common front. Uh, India, Europe, Japan, Korea, Australia, France, uh, other Western nations. And this needs give China a reason to pause. And the competition with China will be multifaceted with each nation participating in its own particular area of expertise or ability. Uh, so there will be those who will compete technologically, Alcas being an example. There'll be others who will compete as the recent <clears throat> G7 indicated uh, the need to show China that we can match uh, the Belt and Road Initiative with infrastructure development. Uh, so you will see multiple geometries, multiple ways in which we indicate to China that we are prepared to cooperate, but only if China respects limits and finds balance itself. Now, I personally don't believe we're going to see a change in a reassessment in Chinese strategy before the party Congress this fall. And even then, uh, China is on a particular role. But the way to indicate to China that we want balance is to create a counterbalance. And in all the ways that you and I are talking about this morning, we're developing that counterbalance. Thank you very much, Frank. That's very clear. Peace within limits. Uh, different, well, multiple fronts that might coalesce into unique fronts and God forbids we're not going towards an actual front. Uh, and on this concept of uh, peace uh, within limits, we, we, we need tools, we've discussed those. Uh, I would want Commander Arnab Das to discuss maybe and complement some of the tools because the AUKUS got uh, got uh, framed around nuclear technology within a larger framework, as Ambassador Wisner has explained to us, Arnab. Uh, you, Arnab, at the, at the MRC in Pune, India, are developing the concept of UDA. Uh, and we're not going to go into uh, the details too much, but the notion of the sounds, notion of uh, silence and sound, uh, underwater uh, is, of course, very much connected to the submarines. Uh, could you explain in, to us, and maybe co through commenting what Ambassador Wisner shared uh, with us, could you explain what India, for instance, for that matter, could share uh, in, 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 well, around the AUKUS uh, alliance? Thank you, Joel, and uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Wisner, for joining us today. And it's indeed a uh, <coughs> privilege for us to be sharing our thoughts with you and listening to you. It's remarkable uh, to get your perspective. Uh, very quickly, uh, the underwater domain awareness framework, <clears throat> I mean, when you talk about AUKUS, it is certainly uh, the tie-up between Australia, uh, UK, and US is the larger hardware component of it. But the AUKUS, the submarine per se, will be deployed in the Indian Ocean region. And the Indian Ocean is tropical waters. So, and you are aware 
tropical waters are very, very different. And <clears throat> there is a lot of understanding required <clears throat> of the local site-specific uh, uh, issues. And that's where I think role of India being a, <clears throat> a major player in the Indian Ocean will make a lot of difference. Uh, understanding the tropical waters and how to deploy strategic submarines like this in a manner that it will help <coughs> the deployment uh, uh, more effectively. So uh, we are pursuing this underwater domain awareness framework and uh, the uniqueness of the UDA framework developed by us is that it is not just the security perspective, it is also the economic and the environmental perspective. Because when we want to look at geostrategic collaboration it has to uh, be, I mean, the present maritime domain awareness has remained limited to security and sometimes it faces a bit of resistance because smaller countries will not be able to afford a completely security-led uh, collaboration. So what we are proposing is getting more technology into it, getting more local site-specific research and development and how to enhance sustainable blue economy while keeping the security dimension also very, very impact. So thank you very much. I think I will not take much time. And <clears throat> I think the UDA framework will be very, very instrumental in actually developing the collaboration that we are looking at and to get, a, get the smaller nations into this. I mean, the entire definition of the Indo-Pacific is the tropical waters of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So getting the tropical uh, dimension uh, is, uh, I think, very important. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Arnab, for, for conveying uh, the other dimensions. And, uh, uh, well, I'm sure this is only the beginning of a conversation uh, across our nations, uh, and it's uh, renewing uh, of, a, of a conversation among friends. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, other opportunities to, to discuss this. But... Maybe a last word for Ambassador Wisner to, if you wish to comment and conclude, sir, on, on what Arnab mentioned about the possibility to expand to other third party countries, or not third party countries, but countries which are less populated, less uh, into uh, security developments, more into other technological developments, civilians, and also more concerned with the environment, so to speak, because. Uh, one way or another, we have to connect the security on the Indo-Pacific to uh, the blue economy and, and, and continue, continuity of life in, in, in the oceans. Uh, I don't know if this is inspiring or too large or topic for the next conversation, but Ambassador Wisner, you have the, the mot de la fin, as they say in France. <laughs> That's a great honor and a challenge. First of all, I've enjoyed this conversation enormously, and I'm pleased to look at it in a multidimensional way that you all have laid out this morning. The key point all of us need to remember is we, we live in a time of very rapid change and of global threat, and that the objective is to reestablish some basis of stability and order in the global system. That can only be done if there is a strong presence of like-minded powers that will stand up and operate together. And that will signal to China that playing by the rules is the right way to proceed. But we have to keep the dialogue with China open. And that dialogue will take in time if we're successful, many dimensions. It won't just be about arms control, and yes, indeed, China is expanding its nuclear capability. It won't be just about AUKUS and Australian submarines that give Australia defense autonomy. It will take many different forms. But I'd like to think one day, one day, Joel and Arne, that we will be back in looking for ways to cooperate with China. And I think you put your finger on an area of huge promise, and that's the environment. For we're all affected <clears throat> by the uh, fact of climate change. We are all victims of the mistakes that we can still, we are, we've made and are continuing to make. 
And the only way that climate change can be dealt with is cooperatively, bringing to bear the kinds of scientific insights that ARNAP is applying uh, as you'd look at the impact on oceans. Um, so I would like to leave my word of hope for this discussion, Joel, to say that our long goal, our long distance aim is stability and balance, but we need to get there with dialogue and climate is going to be a really juicy target in my mind for cooperative development. Thank you very much, Frank, on those words on like-mindedness, like-mindedness, uh, dialogue and hope for cooperation. Uh, that gives us some hint that maybe we are right to be slightly optimistic in this environment. So I thank you very much for your time, Frank. It's been a pleasure seeing you again. Uh, thank you, Arnab, and uh, thank you, Mallory, who's been uh, helping us pilot thank you, this uh, Weisner. Thank you, Joel. interview. Thank you. And thank you to uh, all of you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.